Uh, good day, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I just want to be assured that we are not only you're not only hearing me, but we are live and we are being recorded. Um, at this time, to begin our inaugural School of Engineering Industrial Work Experience Leadership Seminar, we are going to start out by inviting or evoking the presence of the Lord. And to do so, we are going to be asking uh, Mr. Jermaine Sears, Vice President Planning of the SOE Students Council to invite the presence of the Lord with us at this time. Mr. Sears, are you are hearing? All right, I believe that there we have missed um, Mr. Sears. Uh, say hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I'll try to plug in later. You hear me, right? Very clear. All right. Um, please bow your heads in reverence. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this opportunity for all of us to be gathered here via Zoom. I want this seminar to be very informative and very knowledgeable, Father God. Please give us the strength, the energy, and the perseverance. Enjoy this, Father God, in your humble name, I pray. Amen. 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 And it sounds as if we have Amen. just gotten a special prayer from evangelists, engineer, and all of these other stuff. So thank you so very much. At this time, based on the program, um, I'm going to kindly ask um, uh, Mr. Mr. Rick, um, please to share the program, um, one of the co-hosts in the chat, so the participants are able to access the program. So we are going to be following the program. At this time, I, I'm going to be doing the opening remarks. My name is Junior Bennett, lecturer and industrial work experience coordinator at the University of Technology, Jamaica. The pandemic has created several opportunities amidst the challenges. Operate organizations now more than ever have recognized a greater need for creativity, innovation, and continuous improvements of productivity for all personnel, processes, and systems. The premier school of engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and Computing at the University of Technology, Jamaica, has made leadership development a priority for all our graduates. As a consequence, today we are excited to launch the first inaugural industrial work experience leadership seminar under the team developing high impact engineers and leaders for the global market. The need for STEM graduates, and in particular engineers, to effectively manage and efficiently lead multidisciplinary team is a high priority for the School of Engineering at UTEC from its inception. It is the aim of the School of Engineering to host an annual engineering leadership seminar specifically for students enrolled in the industrial work experience program during the last phase of their program. We intend to place greater focus on leadership development concurrently with technical competency at every level of the program. For emphasis, our engineers at UTEC are highly sought after 
both locally and internationally. And if you agree with me, you can always indicate so in the chat. And why are they needed so much? Because of their technical competence and holistic mindset. We are committed as the premier engineering school to continue with emphasis on acquiring essential soft skills for all our graduates. The goals for this seminar are, one, to prepare our students to make a greater impact in job interviews. Two, to prepare our students to be extraordinarily successful as engineers and impactful leaders in the society. We are extremely grateful for the presenters that have agreed to share their wealth of experience with our students and recent graduates. The program is divided into three sections. The first section is the role of manufacturing in Jamaica's economic development. Two, preparation for impactful interviews. Three, the role of GI in the development of graduate engineers. And then after that, we will have a panel discussion to facilitate your, your questions. At this time, we now declare the conference open. Ms. Hall, do we have Ms. Hall at this time? All right, so let me thank you very much. Let me take this opportunity to welcome everyone on behalf of the Industrial Work Experience Program in the School of Engineering to this inaugural leadership seminar. Thank you so very much for making it your duty to come and learn, to come and share, to come and inspire and motivate it. Thank you so very much. The session lineup is going to be very interested, very empowering. So thank you so very much. I going to encourage you as much as practically possible to inform other students so that they can join us because the information that we're going to be exposed to is quite not only interested but powerful and can transform our lives. Thank you so very much for joining us. At this time, we are honored to invite to share with us our own Professor Nilza Aples, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Computing. Welcome, Professor Aples. Thank you so very much for your support and for making this a reality. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Bennett. I am honored to be able to be in this launching of our first um, Industrial Work Experience Leadership Seminar. Um, for the School of Engineering and by extension, the Faculty of Engineering and Computing. I am also mentioning our presenter, uh, Mr. Siaga, Mrs. White, and my fellow engineer and colleagues, Rickex. And um, our students, I see that some other students are coming up, and our colleagues, uh, so um, all the mechanical um, department in from the head to everyone present. So good afternoon. Um, I was looking at the team of the, of the seminar and goes to developing high impact engineers in the, and, lead, and leaders for the global market. And it's actually, well, it's probably an, it's actually an excellent team and also very timely when we look at the role that the engineers played in the society. Um, I remember the last symposium that the School of Engineering hosts for the student final year project. And I was just mentioning the, I, I took the time to highlight the role that engineers have played in the pandemics. I, mean, I think we have been acknowledging everyone, the doctors, the first responders, but nobody um, really have mentioned the role that engineers have played keeping um, the industries working, the electricity as our fingerprint, the internet, the connectivities, and all that there is an engineer um, that has been leading um, all these activities. 
the, the University of Technology as um, from in section has put an emphasis in hands-on experience. This is something that UTEC has is known on when the university, when we move from transition from, from the College of Arts, Science and Technology to university, we try to bring into our engineering programs the, the high theoretical knowledge that an engineer for different disciplines would require. And over the year, we have enhanced the program to make sure that our graduates and our graduate attribute for, in particular, for the School of Engineering and the Faculty of Engineering and Computing has a brand name. The industrial work experience with the 400 hours that is actually compulsory for our students. We are basically one of the initiators. It's actually done in other faculties, but this type of work is really, um, the, our faculty is one of the pioneers and is, is trying to emphasize the, the basic experiential learning that is the foundation of what our graduates are taking into the industry. When we designed this program and it was intentional, the university also provides as part of the quality assurance, um, a cathedra of professionals through our different advisory committee that also support the delivery of the program in terms of the, the level of technical skills that the graduates need to have to be in the industry. But also we are talking about how you become a lead in your discipline, how you are able to, to manage and, you know, and take all this initiative and the responsiveness to solving solutions that are going to be, um, you're going to be exposed as an engineer um, when you start uh, leaving the university. We also talk about being a lead in your discipline because we are expecting our graduates to be um, this engineer that is able to design, is able to assess, is able to revamp, is able to, to transform what the technological process is and is able to, as time goes on, move with the, with the, with the new developments. Um, and we're talking about, you know, industrial revolution and so on and so forth, and how they, you, the, 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 we are preparing this graduate for a life learning learning. During this process, the necessary skills to lead is also introduced. Our, what is an intention, is our intention to introduce. And we are expecting as well with the, with the industrial work experience that our graduate and our students are um, going through from the end of the, I think third and four years in particular. I think some starting second, but mainly in the third and four year because they have the, at least the required knowledge to interact and be part of teams in the industry doing engineering work. That's basically the emphasis that we would like for this. Um, the seminar, um, the focus for the seminar today is, is very relevant and what is going to provide in terms of attributes to our student is really remarkable when we look up about the attributes that industry 4.0 requires of the, of the profession, um, the engineer profession. I wanted to also address the student in particular that are here today, that is an opportunity to learn from professionals in the fields, in the team of the seminar, and also an opportunity to, to interact and also share experience and ask questions. So stay for the loan of the seminar and, 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 and learn. I would like also to take this opportunity to acknowledge Mr. Bennett and leadership in organizing the seminar and also as an um, industrial work experience coordinator. Um, this is um, a great initiative and I believe that I've set an, a new step for the School of Engineering to highlight what we are about. What are the things that our graduates are known for? So 
anything that we do in this area is is really um a welcome and from at the at the level of the the leadership of the faculty um we are always um able to support in any of such activity and i would like also to to acknowledge the school of engineering for once more taking the moving a step ahead in trying to to highlight the importance that the industrial world experience has not just for you tech because of the quality of the graduates but also to the industry and, and to the country for the contribution that our graduates are expected to make and for Jamaica and to the region. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Professor Apels, um, not just for your greetings, but for the leadership that you have brought to the school, the faculty of engineering um, for these many years. Although you don't look um, anywhere aging, <laughs> But we thank you for, <laughs> for your leadership and your support. At this thank time, you, you. you're welcome. At this time, we are going to transition to, a, to a greetings um, from our Vice Dean, um, Dr. Andrew Isaacs. And this um, will be shown um, by a video submitted. So I'm going to be sharing that at this time. And welcome you all to this inaugural seminar for our industrial work experience department. Mr. Chairman, our presenters, Mr. Siaga, Mrs. White, and Engineer Ricketts, to the other members of the organizing committee. Once again, a pleasant good afternoon to you. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you today. However, it was important that I participate in this yet another opportunity for the school to um, provide an avenue for the development of our students. Industrial work experience um, was included as part of our training. Um, it was a deliberate act on our part to have this included. When they then College of Arts, Science and Technology started to issue degrees, post-diploma degrees back in the 1980s. One of the conditions for entry into that degree program was that students or potential students had to have a minimum of two years working in an industry before they could be considered for acceptance to this degree program. This in part was in an effort to maintain the standards of the, 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 the then college, creating what we refer to as work ready graduates. And so when we decided as an institution to move into the provision of full-time degrees, it was important that that nexus between industry and our students was either strengthened, but certainly not broken. While we may have moved from the initial 400 um, industrial work experience hours to um, where we are today, it is indeed a signal to those that we serve, to our stakeholders, the business community, that the School of Engineering recognizes the critical role that our graduates will play in the continued development of the engineering field. And so, given the objectives of this afternoon's activities, I say to our students that they should stay focused in extracting from our presenters those nuggets, those bits of information that will make them even more prepared as they head into the working world. I say to the uh, staff here in, in, in the school, 
those working towards placement and um, recognizing the need for our students to have these additional skills in preparation for going out. I said kudos to you for the conceptualizers of this seminar and those who supported um, the concept, the former head of school and our current coordinator. I say well done. Most importantly, I, I repeat myself to our students, make full use of this afternoon's activities. It will be for your growth and your development. I wish you a productive hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. Uh, Isaacs, um, for your greetings and the, some background information that was quite important and relevant um, for our benefit. Thank you so very much uh, for your leadership as Vice Dean and Acting Head of School for the School of Engineering. At this time, we have the opportunity to get greetings from a very special lady. And I want to say a very fashionable, um, hardworking one as well. Her name is Mrs. Sandy Lawrence, and she is um, the Acting UTEC JA Cooperative Education Coordinator, um, and this is just one of her duties. So we want to welcome her at this time, and thank you very much for joining in, share in this leadership seminar. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Good afternoon to all, Professor Aples, Drs. Isaacs, Wilson, and Graham, our distinguished guest presenters, Mr. Siago, Mrs. White, Engineer Ricketts, other members of faculty, students, and other stakeholders. Good afternoon to you. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings on this very special occasion on behalf of the Cooperative Education Unit and its parent unit, the Office of Teaching and Learning here at UTA Jamaica. The Cooperative Unit is mandated to coordinate a structured approach to integrating classroom learning with the re relevant work experiences which are related to our students' courses of study and their career goals. And as such, we are very pleased to support initiatives like these that seek to develop work readiness among our students. So I wish to commend the representatives from the Faculty of Engineering for organizing this inaugural Industrial Work Experience Cooperative Education Leadership Seminar. This function could not have come at a better time as the challenges that have been brought upon us by the global pandemic require that we pivot, adapt, and press on and find new and innovative ways to function within the global landscape. The theme for this afternoon's seminar, Developing High Impact Engineers and Leaders for the Global Market, is one that promises very enlightening and engaging discussions. And these, I'm sure, are designed to imbue zeal and passion in our students as they strive to navigate the changing global economic landscape. So I implore you, our students in attendance, absorb as much as you can from the presentations and participate fully in the question and answer section. Ensure that you leave the seminar as prepared as you can be to ace that interview and to shine as interns and as permanent staff within the global workforce. And to our presenters, we anticipate a very engaging and interesting um, period of deliberations. And so we look forward with eager anticipation for the day, for the afternoon's discussions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mrs. Lawrence. I want to further say that you have been doing an excellent job um, as, as the leader. Um, you may want to say acting, but I'm going to say as the leader for the Cooperative Education Committee, uh, of which I'm a member as well. Thank you very much for your kind words and your remarks at this time. At this time, we are going to transition um, to hear from a veteran, Dr. Earl Wilson, who is currently the program director for the mechanical and industrial engineering um, degree program. 
So we're going to invite Dr. Wilson to bring greetings at this time. Mr. Chairman, Junior Bennett, Dean Aples, Mr. Siaga, all protocol observed. It's a pleasure of mine to be here to address this gathering and just to bring greetings. For me, your theme can be easily be paraphrased into a Bible verse. Train the young people, young engineers in the way they should go. And when they take over future leadership, they will not depart from it. So your presentation this afternoon is really timely and important. And I'm sure the young people who are here will get a lot from it. And I hope they'll take it to make their future better. Thank you very much and all the best for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, Dr. Wilson is one of my immediate boss. So, um, <laughs> so thank you very much. He's a very detailed, but a concise engineer, very precise, accurate, deliver on time. Thank you so very much. At this time, we will have our final greeting um, from Dr. Damien, Damien Graham. He is our program leader for the industrial engineering program and has joined Gutech at a very important time where his skill set is very important, his management and leadership skills. So thank you very much. And at this time we'll take Dr. Graham. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Junior Bennett, Professor Dean Aples, sorry, Professor and Dean Nilza Aples of UTEC and Mr. Siaga, Mitchell Siaga of the GMEA. I'd like to first of all point out the importance of today's conference in giving the work experience to students who otherwise would not have an opportunity to sharpen their skills. There's an old adage that says, the best time to plant a tree is either today or 20 years ago, because it takes about 20 years for a tree to grow. And indeed, in Western cultures, places like Japan, they have a philosophy where they always look to planning 20 years into the future so that the future youth can be positively impacted. The theme of the conference today is very timely. And we in the industrial engineering department are very keen on ensuring that we play our part. Industrial engineers are expected to support and provide that quintessential ingredient. Indeed, as industrial engineers, it is said that for every eight members of management and engineering that are out there, you need at least one industrial engineer to make things better because we are optimizers and that is how we function. And so from our standpoint, what I would like to bring greetings to say is that the focus of leadership should be on ensuring that you drive skills of productivity, not just in terms of the know-how, but also in terms of the mindset. The behavior in human and man-made systems is something that cannot be understated. And therefore, in ensuring that we have graduate-ready participants in this program, I want you to bear in mind in the behavioral aspect of this program, how you will shape the mind of yourself to impact those that are in the program. Thank you very much all protocols being observed and have a wonderful rest of the program. Thank you, Dr. Graham. And I see that you, your crib is live and direct. Thank you so very much for your input and your contribution and your remarks at this time. Um, at this time, we are going to invite 
to introduce to us our keynote speaker. And we will be inviting Ms. Chave Scale. She is a civil engineering final year student who will bring um, the introduction to us at this time. After which we will hear from our keynote speaker, which we're all looking forward to hear. Thank you very much, Ms. Chave Scale. All right, I'm just checking to see that everyone can hear me clearly. Can hear you, we can see you. Okay, perfectly. All right, so with all protocols involved, um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Mr. Metri Siaga. So Mr. Metri Siaga's resume is tr the true definition of leadership and experience. He was the former president of the JMEA, J -M -E -A, the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association. He serves as the vice chairman of JAMPRO and was also the youngest elected president of the Jamaica U Drive Association. Today, Mr. Siaga is the managing director of the Jamaica Fiberglass Products Limited and is the chairman at the Jamaica Special Economic Zones Authority. He has definitely shown his versatility in leadership by being the head of five different companies and is still involved on different boards today. Some of these boards include the Board of Jamaica Promotions Corporation, the AMG Packaging and Paper Company, and the Jamaica Paramount Trading Limited. Who better to address us and to assist us in developing high impact engineers, helping to mold us as leaders for the global market. With his bachelor's degree in business from the Florida International University, he returned to Jamaica with this determined mindset to impact and to improve our economy. He started multiple businesses such as the rent-a-car business and a travel agency and has also entered into motor vehicle sales and therefore established a manufacturing business. Even now, Mr. Siaga constantly proves to be an outstandingly qualified, determined, and well-experienced businessman as he continues to be a great leader in all his capacities. And I believe that he will be more than able to direct us as we make our next step in our professional lives. It is indeed a pleasure to have Mr. Metri Siaga here with us. So can we welcome him as he comes to make his presentation? Let us welcome Mr. Metri Siaga. Thank you so very much, Chave. Um, you have been too kind, and I hope that I can live up to your, your, your glowing um, introduction of me. Um, let, let me start by saying thanks very much to Junior for in, inviting me here. Um, you know, I, I know very little about engineering, and um, when I looked at the topic um, that I was asked to speak on today, the role of manufacturing in Jamaica prior, during, and post pandemic. It's something that I've been passionate about and I've been so for many years. And the pandemic has only served to highlight the mistakes that we have made as a, have made and, and continue to make as a country. And, um, it, it shows me that my thoughts were correct. Uh, and I'm going to share them with you today as best as I can. No, I'm not going to give a speech, so to speak, today. I'm going to try to speak with the people in this room. And if, the, if there is anybody that has any questions along the way or comments, I'm more than happy to stop and take them because I don't have a, a presentation, so to speak. I, I, I'm, I'm here to chat. Okay, that's okay with everybody not not to you um also mr wilson i think it is very unfair that you have that beautiful backdrop of those mangas and you're not offering any to us they, they, they really look nice um so next time <laughs> um if i were to ask everyone in this room what is jamaica's greatest natural resource uh, I'm, I'm sure that I, I would get answers like sun, sand, and sea, or, or rum, or coffee, or bauxite, or, or people. Uh, and while those would all be good answers, the truth is they'd all be wrong. And why do I say that? 
Because if you have ever heard people talk about when you're buying a property, what are the three most important things when you're buying a property? They are location, location, and location. And Jamaica is number one where location is concerned in the Americas. So Jamaica is located in the Americas where a country like Singapore is located in Asia. And I had the opportunity of going to Singapore about four years ago when I was chairman of the Jamaica Special Economic Zone Authority. And what I heard and what I saw made me realize the mistake that we have made. Successive governments have made in Jamaica over the many years from our independence. And I heard that the premier of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, came to Jamaica in the 60s and saw what we had and went back to Singapore and said, where we are located is the perfect foil to allow us to be and our economy to be a global logistics hub. So for years, what we have done in Jamaica is we have centered our economy around service, around tourism, and around export of bauxite. And, uh, uh, and export of other um, other products that are considered commodities. And if you know anything about Singapore or have read anything, you would realize that Singapore was much, much worse off than Jamaica was in the 60s. They were a very poor country. They, they were basically a fishing village. So if any of you have been to, to Old Harbor Fishing Village and see the type of poverty that exists in places like that, you would understand what the entire country of Singapore looked like. And what was important to see and what they highlight is that where those poor broken down fishing villages used to be are now high-rise hotels. And I never forget, I was standing on the 50th floor in my room of a hotel and looking out at the vista and right across the vista that I could see were hundreds and hundreds of hotels and buildings that were in excess of a hundred stories. And I thought to myself, well, how many, how many buildings do we have in Jamaica that have even 50 floors? And I cast my mind and realized that we had none. We don't even have one. Now, to give you some perspective on this, Singapore is the size of one of our parishes in Jamaica, just one. It is one fifteenth the size of Jamaica. Jamaica's GDP, as I'm sure most people on this chat or, or on this Zoom call know, our GDP is about 5,000 US dollars per person. The GDP in Singapore is $55,000 per person. That means that the average person in Singapore earns 55,000 US dollars a year. They have a population of 3 million people, just like we do, 3 million Singaporeans, and we have 3 million Jamaicans. But they have an additional 3 million people who they have imported because there's so much work there. And I thought to myself, what have we done wrong? And the simple answer is, we have not invested in our people. We have not invested in training our people to be engineers. We have not invested in our economy to develop our economy 
as a global logistics centered economy. What we have done is we have decided that we are going to trade and service ourselves out of our debt, and we will never do that. It is only until we start to utilize people that are in your program, utilize the minds of people. It is only when we start to trade at the higher end. So let me give you an example. So for many, many years, we have had men and women cutting cane in Jamaica and reaping coffee beans in Jamaica. And you know what has happened to those people? They have been poor and they have stayed poor because we have taken those commodities and we have exported them to countries like the United States and to the United Kingdom where they have used engineers like yourselves and they have added value to those things and they have sold them back to us. They have taught us how to like those things and sold them back to us and sold them to the rest of the world. And they have become rich and we have remained poor. So I'll never forget, in going to Singapore, I started to look up some information. And I realized, I don't know if how many of you know, but Jamaica's um, manufacturing contribution to GDP is about 8%. And when I looked at Singapore, it was 20 something percent. And I said, well, that is absolutely crazy because there's no way you can have manufacturing. You can't have any scale to manufacture in a country that is one fifteenth the size of Jamaica, that is as big as a parish. And I went and I asked the question, and I was told that Singapore does not have a single cow in the country. So they don't produce any milk. They don't have a single stock of sugar cane. So they don't produce any sugar. And they don't grow one coffee tree, not one single one. So they don't have even one coffee bean. They make no coffee. But what they do is, ladies and gentlemen, is they import those raw materials, those commodities, and then they add value to them at a high level. <clears throat> so they utilize the services of engineers and skilled people, and they turn those three commodities into one of the finest coffee drinks in the world. And they have factories that manufacture them and they export it, that for a very high premium price all over the world. In doing that, they have got rich and we have remained poor. And to me, that was the most succinct bit of information for me, because a light bulb went off to me that we don't need to be exporting any more bauxite. What we need to do is we need smart people like yourselves and the people that you're graduating to go in and tell us how we can turn that bauxite into alumina, then how we can turn the alumina into aluminum, then how we can turn that aluminum into car parts, and then how we can turn those car parts into a major export product for us to make us wealthy. By the same token, we don't need to be selling any more coffee to the Japanese who then determine what price they pay us for it because they have us over the coals. What we need to do is value add that coffee. Same with sugar. And many, many other, I'm looking at the beautiful mangoes on the screen. I want us to have mango crops and not uh, and export mangoes 
I want us to make mango juice. I want us to make mango chips. I want us to add value. So what has the pandemic shown us? It's shown us that there are going to be times that we have to rely on ourselves. There are times when there's no tourists. You realize that every every hurricane season, when a hurricane starts to come this way, we lose all our tourists. Oh, most of our tourists come from the United States, about 80% of them. Every time that there is some disruption in the region, they view it as disruption in Jamaica, and they don't come. We have got to stop relying and putting all our eggs in one basket. The baskets that we have chosen as a country is tourism and services. And more recently, BPO. Whilst those are excellent sectors that we need, and we need them, they're very important. We cannot continue to do it at the expense of manufacturing, and value-added production. And I feel, you know, just let me mention one other thing. I don't know how many of you know this, but in the last six months, shipping rates out of China have gone up by some 400 to 600%. A container that used to cost me of raw material from China, $4,000, now costs me between sixteen and $20,000. These are world issues that happen all the time. These are things that we have no control over. That's why we have to bring the control home. So in closing, I would say that I would encourage everybody that has a platform to speak on, everybody that gets a soapbox to stand on, every interview that you go on, Please try to encourage the powers that be that Jamaica is not using its most important resource. And that most important resource, in my humble opinion, is its location. We have had it forever and we have never used it. Just think about how important how it is to have customers in the very largest market in the whole world, the United States, that if you throw a stone from Jamaica, you can almost reach Florida. That market has between two and 300 million people, the wealthiest people in the world. And if you look to our South, in South America, South and Central America has another 200 million people. And we are not selling them anything to speak of. We have a lot of advantages here in Jamaica. We have a very good infrastructure. We have, we speak English. We have good, we have a good system of government. We have a reliable system of government that has, we have been a solid democracy since our independence. We have it all. We have, we have great telecommunications. As much as we cost flow and digital, it's very good. We have good electricity. We have good power supply. So with all of these things, I think Jamaica has the opportunity. And I think that there is great, great opportunity <clears throat> for people in engineering, in the fields that you're in, because if Jamaica is smart, and if we continue to push the powers that be, we will make Jamaica into the first world country that we know we are. We already feel we are a first world country. We just don't have the dollars yet, but we're on the way to getting there if we do the right things. So thank you very much for having me. It's been my pleasure to speak to you today. And I hope that I have given at least you some food for thought. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Sierra. You have done a very interesting, I would say, not just done, but you have started 
an interesting discussion that I believe that we definitely will need to take any burning question. Do we have a burning question? I'm not sure if Mr. Sierra will be able to stay for the panel um, um, session, but I'm, he's, I'm sure he's willing to take um, one or two questions. We can facilitate at this time. You can raise your hand. Um, we can take just two questions and you can add the other questions in the chat. Do we have any burning questions or comment? All right, so while I'm looking for the hand, I just want to comment by saying that some of the comments that you, you made were very um, timely, very relevant. Everyone probably know I have a bias to manufacturing and believe that manufacturing is one of the things that we have not really take um, very seriously. And as you have said, we need to stop focusing um, and to a large extent and, and merely, merely importing um, in terms of importing um, stuff, or, or we need to really focus on adding values to our raw material, not merely exporting them, you know, and other persons are selling them. I have the opportunity of visiting several industries, including the coffee industry, and, and some of our coffee basically are, are, are being served in the White House under the Blue Mountain Peak and many places. And we said, I mean, what value are we getting from using of the Blue Mountain? you know, um, coffee. So I believe at the end of the day, we need to find a way to add more values and the Faculty of Engineering and Computing, uh, uh, and in particular, the School of Engineering are training several uh, categories of engineer. We have chemical engineers that are ready to help with the process. We have mechanical engineering to system. We have civil engineering to give the infrastructure and the over 50 flight of, you know, all of that. We have all of those people, but what happened? International people are asking us, please send us, send your best engineers. We are willing to take them. What are we going to do as Jamaicans to, to help to motivate and encourage our engineers to choose Jamaica as the place to develop, live and grow? All right, I don't want to say too much, Mr. Sierra, but thank you so very much. I believe we have um, a hand raised, um, two hands. I'm going to take Courtney Watson, which then will followed by John Daniel. Courtney Watson. Good afternoon, yeah, good afternoon everyone. Um, I have two questions for Mr. Siaga. Sure, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so first off, um, I want to thank you for the very stimulating um, speech that you gave. It really sparked, um, it really sparked my mind. But a uh, quick question, during your tenure as the head of G JME, a, what would you have done differently looking back now? <laughs> Shouted louder. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you know, the truth is that uh, I was president for four years. I was deputy president for four years before that. And I have been the immediate past president now for the last two or three years. Um, so that's four and four, eight and two, 10, 11 years. I have I've been shouting this from every soapbox that I can stand on. Um, politicians don't listen um, as well as they should. And um, th that is not a political statement. It is, it, it is across um, both political parties. And, and I give a lot of lip service to it, you know, especially when they're in opposition. But when comes time to get this thing done, there is there are hopes to jump through and and they, our government has become too too onerous too full of red tape and and I know that we're trying to solve it but I, I can't tell you I can't tell you anything specifically Courtney that I would have done differently other than you know shout louder i i think one of the things that i'm proud about getting done was merging the manufacturers and exporters association and getting the start of the special economic zone because that is the platform from which our global logistics hubs can be developed so we have a brilliant world-class platform now it's now to get it done and I know that work is being done every day to make it a reality. And, and that is why 
engineers need to get themselves ready because there's going to be need for a lot of engineers in the system, especially when big companies come here and need your minds. All right, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we can't take a follow-up question, but thank you very much. We're going to ask um, John Daniel, go ahead, uh, and then we have Devon Smith. All right, thank you very much. We're not hearing you clearly. You hear me now? Better. All right, thank you. Um, once again, thank you, Mr. Siaga, for that engagement. Thank you. thank you very much. But I want to ask this question. You mentioned our comparison to, to Singapore. Anyway, Singapore, right? Um, well, I want to ask, how do we combat the various regimes that we have? Because Singapore is run by, let's say, a slightly communist <laughs> um, regime. But we also have to remember that Jamaica has a, a level of thinking that we have to overcome. What do you right. think? <clears throat> Listen, it's a very good question. And I'm not telling you that I want us to be Singaporean. No. There, are, there are many, many things that we have in Jamaica that are far superior. Like, as you said, our level of thinking. And I'm going to ask Junior, just give me a moment to tell you a story. Right, right. When we were in Singapore, we went into an elevator, 11 of us, 10 Jamaicans and one man from Singapore, the man that was with us. And as we took off in the elevator, the elevator stopped. So, you know, 10, 10, 11 of us in the elevator, some big man, we all have on jacket and tan, and the elevator stopped. And we said, right, we have to get out of here. And somebody, a gentleman from Singapore said, no, no, please. God picked up his phone, he talked and said, okay, thank you very much. And he come back, I said, what they said? They said, they'll be here in 30 minutes. He said, we can't stay in here for 30 minutes, we're going to die. He said, no, no, we can't. And he sat. And after about 10 minutes, one of the guys pushed from the back, him said, I'm going dead. And he pulled the door. And we were right there on the first floor. And we came out. And I said to the man, I said, you know, why did you not use your initiative to try to allow us to open the door? He said, because that's not what we do. When we are told to wait 30 minutes, we wait 30 minutes. And we know they are coming in 30 minutes. And when I spoke to his boss about it, he said, you know, Singaporeans could use some of Jamaicans' initiative. Our, our, our culture has taught us to do that. So I'm not suggesting that we, we, we start to beat people and lock them up for throwing, throwing them on the ground like Singapore does. But I'm suggesting we take the good from them. And we can take the good without the bad. We need to get a little more disciplined and we need to change our system, our economy to be developed as a logistic centered economy. That's all we say. Thank you so very much, um, Daniel, for all that um, thought provoking question and the response and the fact that we have such an advantage in the way we think. So we need to find a way to unite, to work together, collaborate, yeah. and we need to work as a team and to agree to disagree respectfully. So thank you for it. The final question for Mr. Sir at this time, Devon Smith, go ahead. And then we are going to move on. Thank you, Devon, go ahead. Okay, um, first and foremost, I have to say um, thank you, Mr. Siaga, because um, being the president of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers at UTEC, manufacturing is a big deal for me and being, uh, well, Mr. Bennett has taught me most of my classes, so <laughs> that, will, that will show you uh, manufacturing is a big thing for me. But so the thing, the question what, that I want to ask is, so I understand that at times, like for me, I would want Jamaica to really move towards uh, manufacturing, but then the government of Jamaica undervalues um, young adults' opinions um, and they undervalue us on a whole concerning salary. Um, so then we have the brain drain um, thing that happens. So what would you suggest? Um, sh should me as a young um, individual, I have student loans to pay back 
and all that stuff. I have bills to pay, you know, food to eat. Um, I stay in Jamaica. I'm not going to, going to get anything, really. When the overseas companies are telling me, hey, come, and I will pay all of this. Um, how do you think we could combat that issue? It's a great question. And I'm telling you that, first of all, I hope that mindset is changing. And, and you know, when I look at somebody who is on this panel, like, like Damian Graham, who is a young man, who, when I met, was the head of one of the largest government institutions in, in Jamaica. Um, so I think the mindset is changing and your, your school of technology is helping to shape that. Um, However, the way I'm envisaging it is that I expect Devon for those companies to be coming here. I expect those companies to be here and to be calling you. And I'm expecting you to be going to the interviews and picking, choosing and refusing and demanding the salaries and demanding the benefits when we have the demand. And to, de to get that demand, we have to develop the, the, the system of, govern, of governance. And if we have a logistics-centered economy and we start to get those companies coming in, then the demand will be there. Then the demand will be there for your services. So I'm not asking anybody to give up on their dream or their ability to earn or any such thing. I am saying to you, and maybe it's not you, maybe it's the next class or the next class, but I'm saying that if we all work together to push in the right direction, we will end up having companies right here demanding your services and you being able to demand the, a, a good compensation. And let's get our GDP from $5,000 closer to 55000 Okay, thank you for that answer. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Um, Devon, for your question, and thank you so very much, Mr. Siaga. I just want to say, um, on a brighter side as well, I believe that this government um, is facilitating more opinions of the young people and have made a lot of opportunities. And so I, I believe that things are improving. Most of you would have known that I am now the person being selected or being appointed to represent the Jamaica Institution of Engineering and the National Commission for Science and, and, and Technology, which is a big deal. Back then, you would not have some person as young as me. I'm not going to tell you how young I am, <laughs> but to be on it, I would, I'm going to say I am within Dr. Graham's age group, right, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> and well, so it is the first time in my life that a prime minister is my junior and, and by many years. So I, I, I feel that we, we have the right mix of things happening to, to allow the youth to be heard. Yes, and thank you so very much and for your advice. If you are able to stay with us for the panel session, definitely we'll be happy. Uh, un unfortunately, I am not. I have another meeting starting in 10 minutes and um, that, that, that I am cheering as well. I, I, I see uh, Dr. Graham has a... Uh, has his hand up, and uh, if I could take that last one, is uh, yes, definitely. We'll facilitate that one. Go ahead, Dr. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Metri, as usual, a, a, a very spirited and strong delivery of a very important topic. Now, one of the things I, I also observed, because like you, I went on the trip to Singapore, and I, and I thought it would be important for you to mention it. Is the, is the level of the educational system in Singapore. That's one of the hallmarks of what has given them such high levels of productivity, which is the theme that we're on. So I, I was thinking to myself, would you like to just make a few comments in relation to their approach to the educational system, which is in, among, among the best in the world. I believe they are at number within the top five, along with Barbados and, and places like Norway um, yeah. that have distinguished themselves and how important that is in enabling a, a workforce to be productive. Thank you. And, yeah. and thank you for the, for the compliments. Yeah, yeah. 
Welcome, dear man. Listen, uh, you, you're right. It, it, it does start with education. And, and their mindset to education is different from ours. And I think it was Devon that, that asked about, um, uh, or maybe not. Somebody asked a little earlier about, you know, the culture and, and how do we balance. And it's a very delicate balance because in Singapore, you're not going to be allowed to to not go to school and go climb mango tree and kick ball and that sort of thing. It, it's simply not going to be allowed. Um, and we have got to find the very delicate balance between um, the the rigors of, uh, and they would be very hurt to hear you talk about communism, uh, the, the rigors of a very strict society uh, compared to what I would say is a very loose society uh, th that we live in. And, and I think there has to be balance. I, I, I don't want in any way for us to think that we, we, we should we, we should attack our, our spirit because we have a, an amazing spirit. But I am tired, quite frankly, of hearing, oh, Jamaican people are so nice, so that's why we get tourists here. Quite frankly, I'm less concerned about being nice to tourists. I'm more about getting educated people who can earn a very, very good salary because they are working at a high-paying job. And if I have to pick between those two, I'm taking the latter. So, uh, you know, I, I want us to keep our, our uniqueness, but remember that the education is critical. And we, we have to have some, some hard stops that we're not going to allow to go beyond. And educating our population is a critical component. I mean, for example, we cannot continue to have uh, the cohort of persons coming out of high school every year that simply just are not able to move forward, that that, that could not attend university because they can't really read and write. Uh, that has to be part of the the problem that we have to address. So, we so have to invite you again, Mr. Siaga, as you know, I will contact you further. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I'm going to apologize to the other presenters and we are going to ask the audience to stick with us for another 45 minutes because what we the packet that we have here for you is is going to be very enjoyable and I have my water okay. so thank you very much Mr. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for having me thank you all for participating and it was my pleasure that was very welcome okay. on the behalf of the School of Engineering and the faculty and the university at large uh, at this time we are going to transition. Um, we should be getting uh, a violist um, at this time. Do we have the violist? Michael Wilson, are you ready? If not, we are going to be looking at our second presenter's um, introduction. And um, this is very, very special to me. So we are going to have uh, Miss Brianna Hansen, um, electrical and computing engineer in first years. Uh, first year student is going to be bringing the introduction to us. No, let me go. Let me apologize for that. No, sorry, thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to have introduction of speaker by Mr. Rick Darby, who will be introducing to you a very special lady, honorable lady, beautiful lady, someone who have touched my life, impact my life in more ways than now. The fact that I'm able to articulate and be here in this capacity speaks volume of my sister, Tamara White, which is highly qualified and competent. I'm not the one doing the introduction, but I just want to mention that she has really inspired and helped me today. And if I continue, I may cry. So I'm going to ask Rick Darby to come and introduce my sister, Rick. Go ahead. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, as you can hear from Mr. Bennett's passion, you can hear that Mrs. White is a wonderful, indeed a wonderful lady. Now, I'm here to introduce to you Mrs. Tamara K. White. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Human Resource Management from the UCC and an MBA from the Mona School of Business and is internationally customer 
service certified through the Roxall University. She has over 12 years of leadership experience. With the last nine years, they have been with a multi-international corporation where she currently occupies the position as senior role manager, as senior manager, investment sales and investment consultant. Mrs. White is an experienced trainer, lecturer, investment banker, and mentor. She is an she is a passionate about service, excellence, and change leadership. And she believes that the right hire is key to achieving business success and engaged clients. She is married to Leeton, registered architect who received the training at the Caribbean School of Architect, UTEC. Together, they have two energetic boys. I now proudly introduce to you, Mrs. Tamara White to do her presentation. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Darby. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Mr. Junior Bennett, my brother. He has been an inspiration to me as well. So it's quite mutual. I just want to check to see if you are seeing my screen. Are you? Yes. Yes, we're able to see your screen. OK. All right, so okay. I think this is needs to be maximized a bit. You know, I listened with great interest as um, Mr. Siago did his presentation. Uh, what he had to share was quite insightful, and I hope that you feel stirred, um, especially as engineer students, to go out and make your mark, um, impact your world positively, right? So I would like to also join in acknowledging all of the persons who are instrumental <laughs> in putting together today's session, Mr. Bennett. Thank you so much for your creativity, your instrumentality, and your absolute passion for the development of our young people. I would also like to recognize Professor Aples, Dr. Isaacs, and Dr. Graham. I would have seen you in a couple of settings on multiple occasions, Dr. Graham, and I was quite pleased when I heard that special sound in your background. You know, It made me feel a little bit more at home and quite <laughs> connected with the flow of um, how the presentation is going. I just want to confirm um, that you're seeing my screen, are you? Let me just stop this for a minute. And can you hear me clearly? Yes, we are hearing you, we are seeing you, and we are oh. expecting. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to continue with the presentation. Um, and then we will have more time to have some questions facilitated. All right, so I'm delighted at this opportunity to share my insights and tips on how to prepare for impactful interview. That's precisely what I'm here to speak about this afternoon. So I have been the hiring manager <laughs> um, for too many times than I can count. And I've also conducted a lot more interviews than I can possibly remember. And the experiences that I'm going to share, the points that I'm going to share with you this afternoon are from my personal experience, um, things that I've seen where candidates, you know, would have had the opportunity to do a lot better. And I really want to um, ask that you, you know, stay engaged with the presentation and ask your questions using the chat or uh, Mr. Bennett will indicate at the appropriate time to do so. Okay, so, <clears throat> so your resume was great and you got the job interview. You're between excited and scared at the same time. Can anybody attest to that? So you may have some questions. Will it be a panel interview? Will they like me? What should I really expect? Well, I'm here to tell you this afternoon that you really should not worry about it. Don't worry about it. 
interviewers really want you to do well. Okay, think about it. The time that is being spent to deliver or to meet with you in this in this interview setting, there are lots of things that could be done. So interviewers want to feel as if they have used their time efficiently, effectively, meaningfully. And the fact is sometimes there are persons who probably have been pre-selected um, based on maybe the fact that they were acting in a role before and so they would have had an advantage or they have had a nod for this position. But you should always go into that interview and do your best. Bring your A game, right? We are tertiary students and I'm sure you're all aspiring and probably are getting A's, right? So bring your A game because guess what? That interview is not the end all and be all. From that interview, several things could work in your favor. Perhaps you're not suitable for that position that they're interviewing for. However, your interview being so great could spark the creation of a new role, or you could even be referred by the interviewers to other interviewers or other recruiters who are seeking to fill positions. So never ever discount what an interview can do for you. Also remember that an interview is really just a conversation, right? It is a meeting between yourself and this potential employer where this employer is trying to determine two things. They're trying to figure out if you're the best fit for this job that they have at this moment. And they're also trying to determine if you're the best fit for, the, for their organization. Organizations are culturally different. And even though you may do the same job from company to company, the organizations may very well be different in the way they execute um, on these roles. And there are other fundamental cultural distinctions that you know, they try to implement to set them apart from the competition. So try to think about this meeting as a conversation and bring your A game. And you are also in this conversation to determine if, uh, the, if you're making the, the right decision. Because you know, window shopping <laughs> does not necessarily mean that you're buying. So while you may have sent an, a resume to this company, maybe your heart is really with another company and this is an opportunity that you're taking advantage of. No, because a bird in hand is better than a thousand in the bushes, right? So always remember that it's just a conversation um, and persons are getting to know you. It's mutual, it's a two-way street. A quick fact. Um, that I would like to also point out is that, you know, the time factor. I know I mentioned a little bit of this earlier. The interviewers really are a time, and sometimes they may not have had the opportunity to review your resume in detail. And so you really have a narrow window to make a, to make an impact. So it's always best for you to prepare yourself, right? All of this starts with you. So yes, the organization has a role to play, but you are the one going into this interview. The onus is on you to deliver and to make sure that you are positioning yourself as the ideal employee that this company would just not want to lose. All right, and I heard the point earlier you know, about the pay and thing and thing, right? But let us understand that this is a, two-way street. So let me progress a little bit more with the presentation and I'm sure you may have a few questions and I really want to get to those questions. So in preparing for your impactful interview, do your own self-assessment. You know, what, what am I bringing to this role? What is the value that I can possibly add to this? And this is absolutely critical because I see countless times where persons show up for an interview and they're heavily invested in themselves. Yes, you have to look out for yourself, but you also have to remember that you are seeking employment with an organization and there, there are several options. Um, you're not the only person who has the qualification that you have, and maybe you do, maybe you are the one with the highest level of qualification, maybe you have the highest GPA, but do you have the best attitude? Are you the best fit? for this organization. All right, so do a self-assessment. Bring yourself to this, to, to this interview. Make the interview come alive. The competing priorities, I will tell you, they're very, very real. In an interview, and maybe some of you may have had that experience, 
maybe they, maybe a phone is ringing, maybe an email is coming in, and you know things are constantly clamoring for their attention. So don't have a great start and then you fall flat. Keep your energy up and, and keep a positive attitude. I've been in interviews where I'm close to falling asleep. And as a panel, we have codes, nonverbal um, ways that we communicate. And you know, sometimes it is that that helps to keep us awake. So remember that you are putting yourself on display. You're putting yourself out there as the best candidate for this role. So you really need to deliver, all right? So you want to also make sure that you're taking some time to prepare for this interview, right? And preparation is not just about oh, putting together the resume and hoping that they are going to see that you were excellent and that you had a lot of um, awards and, and all of that good stuff. That is great. The resume is a very important tool. It gets you to the interview. Don't expect the resume to do the talking for you. I know sometimes people will come into an interview and they may say, uh, they may be asked the question, tell me about yourself. And they literally start regurgitating the items that are on the resume. That is not the purpose of that particular question. Sometimes it is a, uh, it's, it is binding the interviewer sometime. And I'm being very honest with you. To, to peruse your resume, because perhaps they may have been in interviews all day. A lot of persons have been, inter have been interviewed. They may have reviewed your resume before, but there are several other persons who are ahead of you and they may now just need to scan back and you know, refresh themselves on you know, what is this unique contribution or unique you know, value that this person could possibly add. So you wanna make sure that you are using this time to position yourself as the ideal candidate. How do you do that? You, you should also consider what is it that the employer is trying to fill? What is this position that you're looking to fill? Um, and make sure that you're answering this particular question while linking your skills to what this role is that you're applying for. So this is not the time to talk about um, your cats and dogs, unless you're gonna find a way to link that to maybe the level of um, volunteerism or philanthropy that this particular company is interested in. Maybe they do have a slant, or maybe you are aware that one of the, the, the leaders, directors, or somebody in the room is, is, is an animal lover, and maybe they um, advocate for the health and safety of animals. So whatever you're going to mention in this section of the interview, make sure you link it to what the employer is seeking to fill. Um, a common mistake that some candidates make as well is that they are very loaded, they're very well prepared um, on what they want from this company, right? Very well prepared. They have um, lots of questions to ask about, you know, benefits, for example, vacation, expected salary, workload, but the time to prepare and share how you, they will add value that part, you know, they come up short on that. Um, another tip I also share is that you should not skim on the research, meaning don't, don't take it for granted, do your research. And researching is not just about going to the company's website and looking to see what it is that they do, but dig a little deeper, trying to under, try to understand the company a lot better. Um, what industry they fall in? Who are their top competitors? What are their competitors doing? What are the growing trends in this sector? And how are their customer needs changing? Your engineers, your problem solvers, then you can now align your skill sets, your training, your experience um, as the solution to partnering with this company to take things to the next level. Let's face it, it's not a charity. <laughs> it's a for-profit organization and therefore um, return on investment is something that is going to be important. So position yourself as somebody who is here to add value. So maybe you're saying that, boy, I don't really have um, a lot of experience and all of that good stuff. Um, so I'm going to share with you some pointers on how you can position yourself for that. But just to wrap up on this point about doing your research, um, you want to also, I'm suggesting that you also follow the companies on, on social media. It's not just about the website, the social media updates help you to understand the personality of the company a little bit more. It's not just people who have personality, companies have personality too. Um, some 
companies position themselves as fun and, and happy and exciting. Some are a little bit more um, structured and together. And, and if you think about it, you'll be able to identify companies that fit in, in, in different um, buckets. And you can also, that will also help you based on the way you know how you operate, what gets you going, what gets you motivated, what makes you tick. That will help you to position yourself. I remember very early on um, when I was doing an interview pretty early um, in my career, I, I came across this company who had a tagline that spoke to me deeply. Um, it, it spoke a lot about relationships and I'm big on relationships. And you know, I had a decision between that company and another company, and I just knew that I was going to take the slant of that company that had, even in their mission statement, their slant and focus around um, making or having great relationships. So that is that's also something that can help to give you more impetus to go into that interview and really bring it, nail it, right? So here's a question for you: Do you have a brag file? Brag file. You know, people say people brag and don't show them, you know, do you have a brag fed? What is that? Um, that's really, this is a term I came across um, from this company, I think it's Courier Cheesecake. So what this brag file is, um, and I've had one for years, I just didn't call it a brag file until recently, right? So it's really a compilation of files or great pieces of um, commendations, maybe letters, um, maybe customer um, feedback that are great about you. Maybe you went on internship and you got a letter from, from the employer speaking to your excellent work ethic, just how passionate and how passionate and, and intrigued and engaging and how much of a problem solver you are, whatever it is, keep them together, collate them. And that can actually become very advantageous for you. So you can actually take that to the interview with you. If it is a face-to-face -face interview, position it strategically on, 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 on the desk. Um, these are just some ideas. Or you can make a reference to it should the interviewers become more interested in, in, in other aspects of your, your life in terms of your experience and qualifications. You can make a reference to it. And you can also make it available for them to um, to peruse. So the copy that you're going to take with you, make sure it's not the original so you can use it for future. All right. So some of you may say you don't have a lot of experience. So you really don't have a lot to brag about. Well, you actually do. Just think about it. Um, you would have been in school for what, three to four years or four to five years. Um, so your professors may have been very impressed with you. I know for sure um, Mr. Bennett has had quite a number of professors who um, are thoroughly thrilled with his astuteness. So and uh, his breakfast should be very huge, by the way. So, you know, you can include those commendations from your professors, any awards that you may have received. So, you know, you can think about those aspects. So you're not really creating your resume here. It's more of, you know, think of it like your gallery of achievements, except you are putting it in more or less of a portfolio style and you're creative, you can figure out how you would want to display that. And I'm sure you can come up with creative ways to digitize it as well. So you can share a link with the interviewers. All right, also do not discount your, your research um, and the project groups that you're a part of. So I realized we have some first years because I saw that on the agenda. Um, don't don't underestimate what being a part of a group can do and, and playing your role effectively and completely as a member of the group. So you may not always be the leader, but um, as a contributing member of the, of the group, make sure you bring your A game because this could be something that will come in handy for you when you go to an interview, you can sell yourself to say you were part of this team, you were part of this, um, this project and this was your contribution. So in group settings, I know the tendency is to say we, but when you sit in an interview, think about what is my unique contribution. So yes, this was a group effort. And at the end of the day, the group got an A, but what was your specific contribution? We're gonna zoom in on that because where you don't have a lot of job, job experience, that is usually the alternate way of trying to determine what metal you're made of and, and what value really, really could add to this um, organization. Um, I'd also like to share, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to 
um, share just a few more and then wrap. Um, quantify your contributions, right? As best as possible. So um, your engineers, again, you solve problems, you think in numbers. So it would also be great if you could, let's say you were an intern and you identified a problem along the way. You could share that in the interview, you know, as a, you know, position that particular experience in dollars and cents. So I saw the safety problem, I brought it to the attention of my supervisor, and you know, I made some suggestions about how this um this 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 problem could be solved. And I even volunteered to be a part of the solution of this problem. And as a result of that, um, two weeks later, we put hands and heart together. And this, this situation was brought under control, saving the company potential losses and um, possible loss of productive time should somebody, you know, they, you know, could have been hurt as a result of this. So try to link what you, your experiences are to what you're applying for and help the interviewer to see that you are a thinking person. You know, we don't want persons to just come and or be ordered to because we wanted to think and to, to, to bring your creativeness to this process. What value can I add? And make sure you're prepared for some answers. So there are some typical questions that will pop up in interviews. There are a zillion <laughs> resources about them online. There, some of them are from different perspectives. Some, are, some of them are even culturally different, but you can peruse and review. Um, so yes, thank you, Mr. Bennett, I'm senior projecting the slide. So this would have related to the previous point about selling yourself and positioning yourself. All right, so you should also prepare for questions, right? Um, don't, don't allow the interview to end without you making sure that you, I'm sipping up, that you are prepared, all right? So asking question shows that you've done your research. So sometimes people come to the interview and it's, it's question and answer time. Do you have any questions? No, you answered all the questions that I had. Um, so no, no questions. And then there is this interviewer now has to pick up on that dead silence. So you should always have questions. Think about it. You are here wanted to work for this organization that you probably have not worked with at all because maybe you weren't an intern ever with them there must be something that comes to mind um, that you can ask i'll suggest a few you can ask about the culture that exists within the organization because that is something that may be important to you um, i know people typically sometimes the candidates come in they want to ask about benefits they're big on that what can i expect um, organizations, more and more of them, you know, um, well, some of them will publish the the um, like the pay scale and all of that. So for some companies, that is public information. For other companies, that is private and it is salaries are negotiated. Especially a lot of private sector companies, salaries are negotiated and maybe in the exact same position and you're not necessarily getting the exact same pay because there is a scale. So people may have started on. If, uh, point A on the scale and over the years, while remaining in the position, they move up and they move up because they have gained more experience. So don't assume that because you have the same qualification and the person has the same position that you're going up for and they tell you that they're getting X million, that doesn't automatically mean that you are going to get the same amount of money because you may not have that level of experience. So, you know, position yourself to think and ask questions that will help you to get a better understanding of the role and of the organization and to show that you're really interested and excited about bringing your A-game. So the final question I will say, um, there's tons of them, but this particular one that I like um, because it shows me the mindset of the person is, what advice do you have for someone who really wants to excel in this role. When I get this question, I know this person is competitive, they're driven, they're focused, they want to bring their A game. And that's the kind of person that you really want, um, you know, as, as, as hiring managers. So make sure you follow up after the interview is done. Don't just assume that, okay, well, they will usually say they'll get back to you within two weeks, two, two, two weeks. 
but you follow up. Send a very detailed thank you email, not very long and drawn out, just specific to the point and thank them for their time. And I'm going to thank you so much for being a part of this presentation. I hope you found it insightful and I'm on hand to answer any questions that you may have. Over to you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you so very much, uh, Mrs. White. Um, <laughs> thank you so very much. Um, your advice is not only very useful, I have been the recipient of those advice and it has been helping me so much. So I, I, I am a testimony of these advice that have been, these advices that have been given. Um, unfortunately, we are not going to take a direct question for your presentation now. But we're asking you kindly to, to stick around for the panel discussion, which will immediately follow um, um, Engineer Glaser Ricketts' presentation. Can you, will you be able to stick around? Thank you. I think it's possible, yes. <laughs> All right, thank you so very much. So at this time, I'm going to be um, inviting to introduce to you our final presenter, who is um, quite, um, very ready to deliver. Thank you very much for waiting. Um, we are going to go into that presentation right now. And so Ms. Bryna Hansen, a first year electrical and computing engineering student, please um, do the honor of introducing to us our final guest speaker. We're looking forward. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? We're hearing you and we are finally seeing you. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Brenna Hansen, and it is my pleasure to introduce our second and final speaker for today, Gay Shirikits. Gay Shirikits has had a distinguished career as an engineer in Jamaica over three decades. He is a professional engineer and managing director of GAR Engineering Company Limited, a company which provides mechanical engineering services to the mining, electricity, energy, manufacturing, processing and hospitality sectors. He is the current president of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers and the past chairman for the, of the Registration Act Enforcement Committee of the Professional Engineers Registration Board. Engineer Ricketts was commissioned as a Justice of the Peace of St. Andrew in 2012 and a member and steward of the Stackstorp Church, a past president of the Rotary Club of St. Andrew North and a distinguished Paul Harris Fellow. He is committed to the ideals of the Rotary Club of Service Above Self. Engineer Ricketts holds an Executive Master of Business Administration degree and a postgraduate, a postgraduate diploma in Management Studies from the University of West Indies Mona Campus and a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in Mechanical Engineering from the University of West Indies St. Augustine, St. Augustine Campus. Engineer Kids is married to Heather, and they have two children, David and Allison. I now introduce you, the intelligible engineer, Glacier Ricketts. Thank you very much, Ms. Ansel. Engineer Bennett. Yes, I'm right here. Team. Ms. Professor Aples. The gentleman, Mr. Germain, who invoked God's presence. Dr. Andrew Isaacs, Dr. Earl Wilson, Dr. Damian Graham, Ms. Sandy Lawrence, our guest speaker. I realize our guest speaker is not here, but good evening, everyone. And of course, our engineering students, a very special good afternoon to you all. I would love to be able to share, thank you. So I will be speaking on, I take it that you are able to see the screen. Can someone just confirm? Yes, we are able, you could. Good. Thank you very much, good. So I'll be talking this afternoon on the role of GIE in the development of graduate engineers. And of course, it's something that I'm very passionate about. So 
Should I get started here? Excellent. So our presentation this afternoon will give a brief history of GIE. Then we talk about the membership categories, benefits of, join, benefits of joining GIE, opportunities that exist, and outline the recognition of top engineers from tertiary institution, student competition, characteristic of a successful engineer, and testimonials, and of course, we followed by a conclusion. So I give you a brief history of engineering institutions in Jamaica. In 1940s, they are in the 1940s, we have the Jamaica Association of Professional Engineers. And what was the purpose? The advancement of engineering knowledge, the promotion and maintenance of high standards of work in the engineering field, and also to guarantee professional integrity and to protect the engineers. In 1960 through to 1966, we have the joint group of professional engineers that was formed. And this was primarily formed by people who had studied in England and came back to Jamaica. So they were corporate members of various existing professional engineering institutions in the UK. And that group had a transition, had a change of name. And in 1966, you have the formation of the Institution of Engineers Jamaica. In 1970, you have the Jamaica Association of Engineers. And this was formed by new graduates from UTEC and from the Caribbean training who, are, who were trained in St. Augustine, Trinidad. So you have two groups there existing simultaneously, the Institution of Engineers, Jamaica, and Jamaica Association of Engineers. The requirements for being a part of the Institution of Engineers was quite onerous for new engineers. Bright engineers leaving new tech, then cast it was, as well as engineers leaving St. Augustine. So after much discussion, in 1977, you have the formation of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers, which we call GIE. Now, what's the purpose of GIE? If I just name three main things, to promote and exchange and encourage the general advancement of the engineering profession, to promote and encourage the practice of science of engineering, and to facilitate the exchange of information and ideas among the members of the institution and the public. What's the philosophy? Engineers are there to solve problems. And we are talking about enhancing national development, seeing its role as leaders of the profession. So the Jamaica Institution of Engineers sees itself as the only and premier engineering body here in Jamaica. And of course, in doing so, make sure that they have the public interests at heart so the protection of its public concept and image are of importance to us. Now, the question is, you young graduates, why would you, why should you, why should you join, become a part of GIE? What are the benefits? So we have promote, inform, connect, advocate. Opportunities to join a GIE committee and contribute to the development of our nation through the engineering community. We have within GIE, there's 
divisions, several divisions. We have the AAIC, which stands for the Aeronautical, Agricultural, Industrial, and Chemical Engineering Group. You also have the Civil Engineering Group. Mechan and electrical and mechanical. But then there are several GIE committees that are opened and uh, facilitate members to be a part of and as such can serve in that capacity. We have marketing and publication, public relations, partnership and education, membership, membership growth, continuing education, and of course, we have engineering we. But in addition to that, which is, which is on the screen, we have the GIE has different groups. And right now we are doing, re-looking or reviewing the guidelines for design and construction of housing infrastructure. The guidelines, so GIE has groups or committees that ensures that we have guidelines when we are constructing infrastructure buildings. So we have the stormwater, water supply, we have design guidelines there. Continuing education, we have the GIE Foundation, and we'll speak more about that. Building Code of Jamaica, mentorship program, and of course, we have the annual awards dinner and gala. So there are ample opportunities for graduates and non-graduates to be a part of the GIE. So we mentioned that it provides opportunity for professional development, which is key. After graduating from your premier institution, you take. It doesn't stop there. You have to be constantly studying, keeping abreast of the latest technology. And Jamaica Institution of Engineers provides such an opportunity. Set standards for engineering design and, mon and monitoring their implementation. It also represents the interests of engineers fostering the general development of the profession. Still continuing with opportunities for GI membership. So we mentioned continuing education for engineers. Representation of the engineer's interests. And it provides a platform for exchange of ideas and technical exchange. It also provides for promotion of professional ethics, which is important to the engineering profession, and also fostering of technology development and transfer. Um, this thing here. Okay. Now, some avenues in which we can part continue to provide assistance. Can you can be a part of? So we have opportunities to contribute to topical engineering issues through writing articles in the print media and also online media. Opportunities to contribute to and access to the electronic newsletter of the GIE. We have the publication of the GIE newsletter, and we have an opportunity in the paper, in the, on the, in the Sunday paper, Engineers Angle Weekly, where we have articles related to engineering activities. All these are providing opportunities for young graduates to be a part of. We have the GIE conference, week of conference, where we 
present papers. So we have here opportunities for professional development through submission and presentation of papers at technical sessions, seminars, and conferences. Access to GIE Technical Library. We have a fully um, outfitted library at our location where you can access technical publication. You can access journals and other things like that, technical papers. Discount we also offer, being a part of GIE also enjoy discounts on seminars and conferences and access to opportunity for continuing education. Now, continuing education is becoming more and more important because although I'm not going to touch on this now, but in short order, for one to become a professional engineer, you have to make sure that you have continuing education units. So this is managed by PERB, which is the Professional Engineer Registration Board, and that's an act of government. So that's a requirement by law and such Continuing education is of paramount importance. So this just shows you a picture of reaffirming. This was the uh, section of the Engineers Week that was held in 2000 and 2019. Of course, we didn't, we didn't, we 2000 and 2020. Of course, that was done virtually. Normally, we'd have this at a, at a conference seminar, a conference location. But because of COVID, at least, of course, we had to have this virtually. Now, we mentioned about access to information. And importantly, vacancies, job opportunities are also sent. So a company that Mr. Siago would have spoken about, whenever they need an engineer, they will send that information to the Jamaica Institution of Engineering. So our members would be able to access such information. Access to networking opportunities to connect with local, regional, and international engineering bodies and other professions and access to online membership roster so you can identify people of like mind if you are electrical you can know what is happening in that field so those are some of the benefits there professional networking now during during um during our annual awards dinner and gala, we recognize the top engineering students and this is done annually. So we acknowledge the top engineering students from UTEC Jamaica, from UWI, and when we mention UWI here, UWI here, we are talking about students who attended Mona and St. Augustine. And of course, these are Jamaican students who have attended Mona and St. Augustine. They would be the one eligible to be awarded a special award for being their top student. And of course, CMU, Caribbean Maritime University. Now, GIE has different chapters. There is a chapter at UTEC, and I'm hoping that all those who are on the platform here are members of the UTEC Jamaica chapter, GIE chapter. And of course, we have at UWI, CMU, and Portmore Community College. This is just showing the in engagement with, with businesses. We have um, Cisco Limited. They were doing a roadshow, and we endorsed it. From time to time, we are asked to be engaged in speaking engagement. So at this um, yours truly was giving a, a talk on engineering matters, and this is at, at the JDF's 29th anniversary, which was a few months ago. Now, testimonials. We have 
from Junior Bennett, Engineer Junior Bennett, who is the coordinator for this, this evening's program. And just to highlight something here, no one can experience real growth and sustain that growth without meaningful engagement with professional institution. So you are hearing it from your lect one of your lecturers, from Michael James. Michael James is an outstanding young man from who attended UTEC. I think he's a graduate. And I just I read this highlight there. Just being around great minds has allowed me to grow and has availed me many opportunities. May I just say, I want a big thank you to Michael James. He was instrumental in when we pivoted from onto online to do the Engineers Week last year in September. Michael James was integral in the production. I want to thank Michael James at this stage. Wonderful human being. The testimonial continues. Um, engineer Samson Russell. He studied, she studied in, in Cuba. And her me, I just I make mention of her main point here. I need exposure to the local construction sector and also networking. And the GIE has just was just the right place for this. With the GIE, I have been exposed to several aspects of the engineering fraternity, which has given me a more rounded perspective of what engineering is and what it entails. So you can't get that in an institution, in a learning institution like UTEC or CMU or University of the West Indies. Coming into the field and being among like minds, that is when you are benefit. So these are some highlights from some earlier conferences that we have, and it's usually well attended by UTEC students. Here in the middle, you have one of your lecturers who is always integral as a, as a presenter, um, Engineer Bennett. And these are some other pictures. We have a bridge competition, which I think some of you will be very familiar with. And of course, we have tours. Whenever we have new technologies or new in, um, industrial plants being constructed, the Jamaica Institution of Engineers are always given the opportunity to come and tour the facility. So we have the combined heat plant, heat and power plant, and the new Fortress Energy offshore Old Arbor. We actually visited there and were able to see what was happening in that, in that facility. These are still some other pictures. No, registration and membership categories. I just quickly look at these. There are four different categories. We have student, we have graduates, we have corporate, and of course, affiliate. In the interest of time, what we are saying is that students age 16, you can just become a member, not, this, not of the chapter, but you can also become a member of the JIE directly. And all that you need is that you have to be more than age 16. And of course, enrolled in a tertiary institution, an engineering program in a tertiary institution. You have graduates, and you can have one year postgrad training and number of years experience. And we can, all this information is on the, is on the web site and you can avail yourself of this information. Now, what is important? What are the fees associated with this? Student membership is free. Graduate membership, we are saying it's only 5,000 Jamaican dollars. Corporate membership, $7,500. We are setting up a new membership group that institution, it's not, it will not apply to you here, but for example, a plant, a manufacturing plant with a large number of engineers, we tend to give a discount. So that is being worked on. And affiliate members, 3,500. 
So affiliate members, if I go back a little, it's people who are not in an engineering program. So you might be in computing, you might be in chemistry or soci, whatever it is. And you just want to be associated with the engineering fraternity, you can become a member. And the fee is simply $3,500 annually. Now, what are the characteristics of a successful engineer? You have to be a team player. And it's pretty much what um, our speaker earlier was talking about, Miss White. But for engineers, it's very important. You have to be a team player to succeed. Continuous learning, creativity, problem solving. As problem solver, you know, that's really the root of engineering, solving problems. You have to be analytical. Good communication skill. You have to be able to communicate the issues. Meticulous and logical thinker. There's a sequence in which you think. You, it's not a puzzle. There's a logical approach to solving problems. Attention to details. You cannot be rushed. You have to make sure that all bases are covered. And very importantly, ethical behavior, ethical behavior. I cannot overemphasize that. Honesty, among other things. This is what the good, the traits of a good engineer is. And this is what we expect all engineers to maintain good ethical conduct. Successful engineers also need to develop soft skills. We don't, need to, we don't need to even expound on that. It's so important. Outside of training, you have to be able to exhibit soft skills. And of course, in the leadership aspect, leadership has required excellent inter, interpersonal skills and an ability to inspire and motivate others to drive a team to achieve success. Because you are goal-oriented, you must be able to achieve your goal. You can't do it alone. You have to motivate a team with you to do such thing. So in, con in concluding, I would say, I don't even need to ask a question to you. I know you are ready now to come and join the JIE. So that's an opportunity for you to maximize your potential. Access wider professional network. Get updates on engineering jobs opportuni job opportunities and take advantage of the opportunity to contribute to further development of the engineering profession. You don't, in a mutually beneficial way, you don't want to be a part of the association now and 10 years from now, it hasn't changed. It is in the same position. You have a responsibility, having gotten the training at UTEC to be an engineer, you ought to see to develop, see to the development of the engineering profession here in Jamaica and wherever you go. So I thank you. I thank you for being a part of this and thank you for listening. And I now hand over to Engineer Bennett. Thank you very much for such refreshing. Um, lecture, presentation, very interested. And I'm sure that the students at, uni, at UTEC definitely who have not already joined JIE um, student chapter will be involved. And those who are graduating, have graduated recently will also um, join it. And they know um, several other lecturers who are members who will be ready to endorse and if you're from other institutions and you can show proof of your documentation, we are ready to help you as well. Um, we are so delighted, um, the School of Engineering at the University of Technology to have um, this inaugural Industrial Work Experience Leadership Seminar that we intend to continue every year. Thank you so much, Engineering Ricketts. You have been an uh, inspiration to me and my transition and involvement with GIE um, actively since 2014, where I serve on the board, where you're a VP and you're very passionate as a leader 
and a good example of integrity and also want to see other engineers um, develop. And that is something I admire about you and not only concerned about just being involved, but that you actively engage and give back and develop at the same time. So thank you very much. At this time, I think it, we are overdue to have some entertainment. What do you say? All right. Um, we're going to invite Michael Wilson, um, a graduate from the University of Technology, and he is a violin, and he will be sharing us his musical talent. So without further ado, Michael, we have been waiting for you, and this is your time. You have done excellent work in the past, and I'm sure you are ready. Um, I'm going to ask the host, the, the co-host, to um, highlight this video. Thank you very much. Looking forward to great music. Relax. Um, we are at the last. After the musical, we will have our panelists, and then Michael Wilson will come back and give us another. What do you say? Wow, can't wait. You're muted, Mr. Benet. Okay, we're not hearing Michael, thank you. We need... Um, we... I don't know if we can get some more volume. We like what we're hearing so far. Someone really good. Um, so we also have delivered at, a, um, at UTEC um, graduation, um, several ceremonies and um, is an excellent musician and physics educator. Um, looking forward to hearing. And thank you, Mr. Ricketts. Um, Engineer Ricketts will also be able to join us. I know he will be able to join us for a short time for the brief 15 minutes panel discussion. All right, so. All right, so Mr. Wilson um, is, is, is going to get back with us. Um, I think there's some audio, some technical. All right, we almost reached while we're waiting on Mr. Wilson, um, his connection and so on. Um, is there any comment? We can facilitate a comment uh, from someone um, um, at this time. Any comment based on the students? Not a question as yet, just a comment um, based on the experience so far. Um, any comment, burning comment? Um, Want to know if we are meeting the objective of this session? We are just waiting for you, Michael. As soon as you're ready, you just um, unmute and you're just trying to keep time. Any burning comment from anyone? All right, so what we're going to do in the meantime, we're going to go straight ahead with the panel. Um, so we're going to ask Engineer Ricketts to show his face once more. Uh, Miss White is already there, um, glowing in her beauty, like when she just got married. <laughs> All right, is there any burning question for the panelists at this time? And then we'll take Michael after. Um, we can go ask at this time, can we have all the panelists in pin to the screen at this time? Thank you so much, Mr. Green, for the YouTube connection. Um, that you're giving. Thank you so very much, Mr. Rick Darby, excellent student leader um, at the University of Technology. You have given a lot of support to this. 
Um, the students really have bought into it. I'm so delighted to have um, Dela Richards, Jermaine Sears, Shante Green have spent a lot of hours um, working and making this a reality. All right, I have said a lot. Questions? All right, any question? Go ahead, you can raise your hand. All right, we are rather surprised when there is no question, it's, it's either it was just excellent or you are just not focused. We'll just say learning has taken place and therefore they have known, right? There, it was I have clear. a question for you though, don't think you're going to get away. <laughs> now you ask a question during the end of your presentation, what advice would you give? Um, like you're in an interview session and the interviewing is asked, the interviewer or the interviewers, what advice would you give for a person that is aspiring for the role that you're applying for? Um, mm -hmm. How do you, you know, um, can you give some light to that, the importance of that question and, and how that question can help the student to better know whether or not this is a place that they can add value based on their skill and experience and so on? Okay, thank you so much for that. So what advice do you have for somebody who wants to really excel in this role? So the importance of that question um, to an interviewer is that it sends a really great signal that, you know, you want to do well. So it's not enough for you to just, you know, do okay. You really want to excel. And, and that's actually something that is desirable. Um, so in, in terms of um, being prepared for the answer. I mean, they could, they're going to be honest and tell you what it is that they, they would want and they will share with you out of their experience, especially if it is the hiring manager. And typically interview panels will have the manager who the position will report to um, because they have insights and firsthand information on what exactly it is that they're expecting. So um, a job description is really an, an outline of what is generally expected of you um, coming into a role. But of course, it does not detail every single aspect of it, of what you would do in a role. And also there are some intangible things that um, cannot be adequately captured in a job description. So for example, um, the culture of the organization may be of such where um, the leaders, they lead from the top and they want employees to have fun at work. They may have a fun, upbeat culture. That's not something that will necessarily be captured in the, in the, in the job description. But um, in the way that the hiring manager and the other members of the panel Will, will give you pointers on how to really excel in your role. They may share with you that, okay, so we're very, very team-oriented organization. Um, we're we're family-oriented and it's important to us that our team members do well. So automatically that should begin to send some signals to you that um, if you are more of an introverted person or if you like to work alone, if you're more individualistic, then you're gonna have to either make some adjustment to yourself in order to do this job, or you may have to consider finding another role. So it's really important to not just ask these questions when you have the opportunity to do so, but to listen intently, to hear and understand what are those key messages that, that the, the interviewers um, are, are passing on to you. Thank you so very much, uh, Mrs. White. I have a question for engineer Ricketts. Um, we have a lot of engineers that um, primarily focus on just the technical area. Um, some engineering students and he may not even been involved in any of our extracurricular activities and the School of Engineering at UTEC provides so much opportunity. We have GIE, we have IEEE, we have SME, we have so much. And there are some students who just focus on just the technical area alone. What advice do you have for students who really want to be impactful and successful engineer, and how can GIE, um, just reiterate how GIE can be that vehicle? Good. Um, and yes, unfortunately you have that um, engineer Bennett, 
but GIE provides opportunity for mentorship. So, so we start out with, we can assign junior engineers to, to mature or professional engineers to guide them along the path to become professional engineers. But in addition to that, we have so many committees in which they can actually be engaged in. Because some of the times, even after conducting, doing a project at, at university, you need to be able to have this being excess, being able to implement the material that you learn in the field in a practical sense. And the mentorship program allows for that. Now, when JIE has different divisions, so if you are an electrical or a mechanical or civil, wherever you are, there are actual practical experience by just becoming a part of, the, of these respective committees. And from that, you will be able to implement or be able to practice the things that you have learned, the theoretical things that you have learned which is so important until you're able to solve a problem in the field. In the field, that is when it counts. So, and GIE provides that opportunity. You have all the formulas, but the application of the formulas to, in solving problems, that is where the issue is. Thank you very much. I want you to just speak a little more about two things. First, the role of a graduate um, engineer and the council. I want you to speak the opportunity and role there, and also how JI have been um, impacting on a national level, briefly with some of what you have been doing on JI. All right, good. There are several boards that GIE is called upon to make, to make submission to, both in person, in terms of rep representatives on several technical boards. So this is an opportunity for our members to serve at a national level. As in your case, you serve on the, on the science the Science Council. We have other engineers serving on the Energy Council. And throughout, we have engineers in works agencies, JPS, providing critical, critical services to the development of the country. So we have several boards that we have GIE, GIE is called upon to submit representatives on. We, in addition to that, we provide um, training, training, training. And we, we also make our position known on, on national issues. For example, recently we have a drainage problem. We have the minister talking about um, that there aren't technical expertise here in Jamaica to build a, to repair uh, the hospital in Montego Bay. We made comments on these things. So national, we help to direct and provide technical, technical input in the national discourse. Um, so engineers are so important and are called upon, called upon by the government and several organizations to be, to be involved in and make recommendations. In terms of the first question, which is the graduate level, by just being a part of, in fact, there are two graduate members that serve on the council every year, giving them an experience of how leadership, how our organization operates, introducing them to protocols within an organization. But even if you are not selected at that level, as I mentioned earlier, so many committees. I mentioned the, gen, the en, young, young engineer James, the young graduate James, who avail himself of, um, of the 
the work during engineers week, for example. So these are opportunities that are there and all engineers are welcome and we will find somewhere to, of interest to you, the individual engineers to put them for them to excel. All right, thank you so very much, uh, Engineer Ricketts for reminding us that the GIE provides a lot of opportunities and it would be a midst of us not to capitalize on those. I'm going to take a question from Mr. Hugh Cargill, lecturer in the Industrial Engineering Program at the University of Technology. Mr. Cargill. I'm not sure. We have another five minutes. If Mr. Cargill um, could sign in back, I'm not sure if there's a technical um, issue here. Do we see Mr. Hugh Cargill still listed? Um, so we, we missed. Anyone else have any burning question? All right, um, let me ask Ms. White, Mrs. White another question. You have been interviewing a lot of persons. I don't know if you had the distinguished opportunity of interviewing uh, an engineer before. Um, but I just want to reiterate the, the importance of a portfolio, the importance of extracurricular activities, the importance of confidence and so on. Because you know, you're, you speak about persons are just concerned about just the benefit package, which is pretty set, negotiable in some of the public sectors, but private in the private sectors rather, but public sectors are normally said. So um, in terms of the value, can you, you know, please elaborate some more on how engineer can, engineers can better prepare themselves so that they, when, when a non-technical person like yourself and others are interviewing them for a management or leadership role, what are you looking for as a non-technical person? Okay. All right, thank you so much. I mean, I'm listening to your question and a lot of um, angles are pouring out at me um, coming from that question. The, the, um, so my most recent past manager, <laughs> he, he's a trained engineer and he actually worked as an engineer for, for some time. And prior to that, in a previous organization, I had a colleague who was also an engineer and he transitioned to banking. So it's not uncommon for engineers to transition to banking. It's quite a frequent occurrence, right? So um, engineers, um, their strength among other things is just how methodical they are and how linear sometimes they can be and just their ability to you know, critically analyze and look at um, a situation and turn it inside out. Um, one of the things that I will say that will assist engineers in, in their transition to other areas that may not, that will require their engineering skills, but it's not necessarily a core engineering organization, is just a little more um, openness to um, that point that Mr. Ricketts spoke about, about the soft skills. It's absolutely important. And he spoke about the mentorship program that is available through the GIE, is to tap into that because the way how we, we are typically, we will fall into a certain routine and we, we're naturally a certain way. And it sometimes takes practice for us to um, view things a little bit differently. So um, in banking where you're dealing with customers, it's not machine, it's not numbers alone. Um, it's not just a scenario that you're analyzing, but you're thinking about the people on the, on, on the tail end of, of, of this situation that you're faced with. Um, and then not everybody necessarily communicates in, in, in with that le great level of um, technical detail. So, um, it's, it's just that flexibility to understand that you're going to be dealing with different persons. Some of them are like-minded, they're very analytical, you know, they're very logical and therefore communicating with them in that way um, means a lot to them. But if you're thinking about it from a customer's perspective, if you're overly logical and overly analytical, then you may not have that emotional connection. And, and that's where you can miss, or you can, you can miss the mark. So you're saying all the right things. This is the problem. You're, you've clearly identified the problem. 
but where is that empathy to, to, you know, to connect with the customer, for example, and say, okay, well, I acknowledge that you had this problem. I'm really sorry about it. Here is my solution on how to fix it. And sometimes it's just to just listen to what they're saying and, and allow them to express themselves. So it's, it's really a medley of things. It's, it's, it's a combination of being attuned to other perspectives. There are different persons out there, that openness to learn and, and adjust yourself. Um, you know, modulate yourself, be flexible in dealing with different personality types and so on. But it's, it's really important, um, especially in the context of teams. So you may also be um, in a situation where you are an engineer, but you're a part of a project team, which is a cross-functional project team that is made up of persons from multiple skill sets. Everybody is going to have a unique perspective, a different value proposition they're coming to the table with. But, you know, it's really just how you exist in that space and, and still have the level of flexibility to express yourself, bring your value and still be open and receptive to everything else that is going on around you. So it's not just your way or the highway. So, you know, just, just so those are some of the, the quick pointers that I could share on that. Thank you very much. We went to conclude by giving um, um, Engineer Ricketts the last point I see he is you know, he has been smiling. I'm not sure it, why he's smiling. <laughs> and I don't want to ask him off here. So I'm asking, why are you smiling? <laughs> no, I'm in full agreement with Miss White. I think she sums it up beautifully. Yes, you know, we tend to be straight jackets in a way, but yes, we need that soft skill, you know, because we have to be able to understand, understand that there are, different perspectives and different ways and we have to be gentle we have to be gentle with you know the, the environment especially in a situation like the banking where you know customers are right <laughs> you know always always <laughs> yes yes all right thank you so that's very much that's oh, easy the flexibility of engineers and i'm sure all engineers are that flexible as well Absolutely, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. <laughs> and I have a few experiences, so yes. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to say there is, a, there is one of our commercial bank, I don't want to call the bank's name, I've employed 16 of our graduates. So, and, and I'm telling you, definitely banks are employing a lot more engineers than before. And they basically, uh, have to be far more, you know, emotional in terms of emotional intelligence, uh, far more. So we are emphasizing because we're not just training persons um, for the goods producing sector, but we, we are, the service sector is important as well. So thank you so very much. That is important. At this time, we, we are one hour <laughs> of our schedule, but we basically, at this time, we invite um, Michael Wilson at this time, entertain us after which um, we will have the voter thanks and we are out of here but we looking forward to Michael Wilson at this time Uh, we're still not getting anything from my phone, so um, I guess there are lessons to learn as engineer there as well. So um, I'm sure he definitely had wanted to, and I had contacted him with it all honesty at the last minute. So I'm taking responsibility for that uh, going forward, but we are going to give him an opportunity another time. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Shanroy, um, Shanroy, Dennis, are you there? Please to share with us um, the record, the pre-recorded pre um, vote of thanks at this time. Mr. Dennis, are you with us still? Mr. Darby? Sir, I'm, go I'm going to share it. Thank you so very much.
Greetings all to my dear colleagues, lecturers, and distinguished guests. We are here today for this inaugural leadership seminar, which is geared towards preparing all other engineering students for the journey ahead as we transition into our professionals as engineers. My name is John Allen, and I'm a final year industrial engineering student at the University of Technology. It's my honor and great privilege to be given the opportunity to give this vote of thanks to all those who are in attendance today and to all who make this event a success. Now so let me move to the duty that has been entrusted to me. Entire School of Engineering, I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Mr. Mitri Siaga, for his fruitful and engaging discussion on the impact of manufacturing and the huge role it plays in the sustainable development of Jamaica's economic landscape before during and after this pandemic. For this, I thank you, sir. To our next speaker, this is Tamara White. You bestowed on us some extremely vital information on the preparation and the importance of making an impactful interview, which I am certain we all benefited from as we venture into the working world. The School of Engineering wishes to extend our most sincere gratitude to you. And to our final guest speaker, He's a fellow engineer and the president of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers, Mr. Glister Ricketts. You've highlighted the inner workings of the JIE and the role it plays in the development of engineering students and engineering graduates. On behalf of the School of Engineering, we thank you, sir. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the talented Mr. Michael Wilson for his beautifully entertaining musical item, which stimulated both our hearts and our minds. To our Dean and Vice Dean, Professor Nilza Aples and Dr. Andrew Isaacs. Our Corporate Education Coordinator, Mrs. Sandy. Warmest regret to all its members and thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Um, Rick Darby, um, for sharing um, the vote of thanks. Of course, Mr. Michael <laughs> Wilson have received um, thanks for what um, he has not done. But we are going to look forward to next year <laughs> when he will be able to redeem himself <laughs> of that time, right? <laughs> I just want to say on the behalf of the University of Technology um, and our faculty, the Faculty of, of Engineering <laughs> and Computing under the leadership of Professor Nilza Aples, Vice Dean and you know, all the engineering, um, the, the members, the management of the School of Engineering, we want to thank you very much for facilitating, supporting, and embracing this very important leadership seminar. I want to say a very special thanks to the students. If it wasn't for you, we would not even have the need to have this seminar. So thank you for your support. We had up to 70 persons who were in attendance. So we thank you, the, 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 the student representative the, under the leadership of Mr. Rick Darby, outstanding um, leader, um, and his team have done a tremendous job in the design of the flyer, you know, and the YouTube, Mr. Green. Uh, we are so excited that um, we can collaborate with our students and have uh, such a production. Thank you to our speakers, um, Mr. Metri Siaga, uh, Mrs. Tamara White, um, Engineer uh, Glaser Ricketts, all the persons who have done the introduction. And I just want to also say a big up to Dr. Chambers and Mr. Stewart, uh, who were the persons who were involved um, in 2019 when we had the idea, which was supported plan, and we had to cancel it because of the pandemic um, last year. So Dr. Chambers have played a very important role. Thank you so very much, Mr. Stewart, uh, Ms. Marvet Hall. We want to really thank you because the foundation was very important. We had the opportunity now to implement and to make some changes. So we want to acknowledge all the support. If I forget to thank you, I thank you. All the very best. Have yourself a very big.
victorious rest of the week and continue to develop, to inspire, to motivate, and to take your place in society and make your mark. Thank you.